Welcome to the Library of Congress, everybody. I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Kluge Center's mission is to support scholars doing innovative and specialized work and to project scholarly work to a broader audience in accessible ways. Today's event, Polarization and Political Discourse in the U.S., fits squarely into our effort to bring scholarly work to a wider audience. The broad theme, Conversations on the Future of Democracy, animates much of what we do at the Kluge Center. In our view, at the library, no more important conversations could be had. Today's panel discussion will go about 45 minutes with time for questions afterward from the audience. Let me point out that American University's Center for, the Con for Congressional and Presidential Studies is co-sponsoring this event. It's part of an ongoing relationship between American University and the library that we're very proud of at the Library of Congress. The director of the center, on the, on the, to the far right of the, uh, of the platform is David Barker, and he's one of our panelists. David came to American University two years ago from Cal State University, Sacramento, where he directed the Institute for Social Research. He studies political psychology, voting behavior, political communication, legislative behavior, and social welfare policy. He's written three books and dozens of articles. His most recent book, published by Oxford University Press, One Nation, Two Realities, came out last week. Congratulations, David. <laughs> Liliana Mason teaches in the Government and Politics Department at the University of Maryland College Park and is the author of Uncivil Agreement, How Politics Became Our Identity. That came out from the University of Chicago Press just last year. She received her PhD in political psychology from Stony Brook University and a BA in politics from Princeton. Her research on partisan identity, partisan bias, social sorting, and American social polarization has been published widely in academic journals, as well as being featured in major media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, and many others. Let's turn to the uh, laying the groundwork for our conversation this afternoon. Um, but let's be clear on what we're actually talking about, because people throw the term polarization out there all the time, and uh, we want to get some definitions. Aren't there different ways to think about polarization? Let me start with you, Lily. Yeah, um, so thank you also for having me here. This is a very exciting uh, event. The, actually, the way that I started my research was by sort of challenging the traditional view of polarization, which um, until about 10 years ago really was that we disagree, that Americans disagree with each other, Democrats um, are very liberal in their, in their policy attitudes, Republicans are very conservative in their policy attitudes, um, and that was sort of the operating definition for, for quite some time. Uh, then about 10 years, less than 10 years ago, some uh, new work started coming out suggesting that polarization could be separate from that issue-based type. Uh, and that is what we call affective or identity-based polarization, which doesn't actually require us to disagree all that much. In fact, um, it relies, at least my work relies on psychological theories of intergroup conflict to, see, to explain why Democrats and Republicans might actually just dislike each other for reasons that go beyond their, their uh, operational sort of instrumental disagreements. Okay, and so, that, so you're making a distinction between issue polarization and, and an affective polarization. Yeah. Okay, and, and David, um, yeah. why don't you pr provide a rejoinder to that, the kind of yeah. polarization that you study, which is a little bit different from my reading of what you've written. Yeah, absolutely, whoa, <laughs> just, it's really loud. Um, Softer. Uh, so, yeah, there are a couple of other ways to think about polarization as, as well that are, are not inconsistent with what Lily is talking about. But um, my focus has been on, on two things. Uh, first of all, uh, factual polarization is the name of the, the book that uh, John mentioned a second ago, uh, talks about, and the increasing degree to which Americans just don't believe the same things, right? And like operate in completely separate spheres of polarization and our, our movement toward what some people have labeled a, a post-truth political uh, era, in which we're not in yet, but we might indeed be, be moving there. Uh, the second thing uh, is the degree to which the two sides, regardless of the degree to which they agree or disagree, or even really kind of necessarily regardless of the degree to which they like each other or not, are willing to work together, right? The degree to which um, people in Congress uh, are willing to strike deals, uh, negotiate, bargain, make compromises in order to get stuff done, and the degree to which the mass public is willing to support 
their efforts in doing so or, or refuse uh, to go along with that idea. So, uh, you know, we've got four different types of polarization here that we could, could talk about, issue-based polarization, uh, affect-based polarization, factual polarization, and then sort of, I guess, um, you might call it legislative intransigence. So, uh, there you go. So, so in your view, Lily, uh, at least in the ones, in the areas you, you're more specialized in, although you may have a view about any of them, where is it worst? Uh, so, the, basically what I've been seeing in um, just, you know, even up to sort of the most recent public opinion data, most Americans are actually still, to this day, um, what we could call operationally liberal. So, their policy positions on average tend to lean to the left. Um, however, when you ask them about what ideological label they'll apply to themselves, they'll call themselves conservatives. So there's actually a lot of room in the middle for, in policy-based ways for Democrats and Republicans to cooperate. Um, it's just that these identities are so powerful that they don't want that cooperation. And so um, because of uh, you know, a whole host of uh, identity-based reasons, which we can get into in a, in a minute, um, the, uh, the incentives for Democrats and Republicans to cooperate, even when there's a large amount of agreement across the public, the voting public, um, the incentives are just against any, any cooperation at all, and so the identity really seems to be driving a lot of the ways that Democrats and Republicans think about each other and think about themselves. So the affect's worse than the issue, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. What would you say about that, David? Uh, I would agree with that in, entirely. So while it has been the case that we have seen some movement over the course of the past 20 years with respect to issue-based polarization, especially um, more recently, on the, the left, because what Lily mentioned a second ago has been true for a long time in the sense that Americans are operationally liberal, um, but like more likely to call themselves conservatives, right? Um, and then, but that's become a little bit less so, right? So we have seen some, some movement uh, of people becoming more liberal um, and more willing to, to use the term liberal than they used to be, and you see that in a lot of, a lot of Pew data. But that movement that I'm describing is dwarfed by, by what Lily's talking about in terms so, of this. So what exactly do you mean when you say operationally liberal, just to make yeah. sure people get what yeah, you're saying, what you're trying to say by that? So what I mean by that is that if you ask people a series of, say, 20 different policy preference type of questions, right? Do you think the government should uh, spend more or less the same amount of money on health care? Do you think they should spend more or less the same amount of money to protect the environment? Yada, 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 you know, abortion, gay rights, foreign policy, like you go down the list, right? On, on almost everything, uh, a majority of the American public uh, is what we would term liberal, right? But a, a much smaller percentage of the public has been willing to, to label themselves that way. So, um uh, you know, you, when you think about polarization, you're thinking, well, people are divided, whether it's just in their mind or whether there's a, you know, substantive issue. The fact is, there's this division that has developed. Uh, there seems to be an agreement, and it's it's based on party identification, right? That's what you're both saying, right? Well, I, I think it's more complicated than that, but I'll yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, uh, <laughs> but in any case, how did we get here then? Why is it, uh, you know, there's. Plenty of us in the audience remember where that the, every conversation about politics didn't raise the question of polarization. Now every conversation does. So Lily, how, how did we explain to us sort of the progression of why this is the way it is now compared yeah. to say whatever time frame, 20, 30, 40 years ago, whatever you want. So I, uh, I tend to start an abbreviated history of this in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act, uh, after which the Democratic Party really split. And so, uh, large portions of previously self-identified Democrats were um, sort of turned off of the Democratic Party. However, party ID is a very strong type of identity. And so, um, you know, in, during that time, there were not very many Republicans in the South, right? Most Southerners were, most white Southerners were Democrats. So it really basically took a generation for disaffected white Southerners to move out of the Democratic Party, uh, and then their children could identify as Republicans. Um, so, dur so during those years, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were a lot of sort of confusing cues coming from um, the parties themselves, the voters, there were you know, conservative Southern um, Democratic lawmakers in Congress that were being elected to Congress um, for decades. Uh, and then in the 1980s and 1990s, we started seeing the Christian right um, become politically activated and aligned with the Republican Party. So, uh, in the story that I tell, having, you know, first having much more clear racial cues uh, attached to the parties, and then very clear religious cues attached to the parties, 
Uh, we ended up with, and then of course, you know, we had the advent of partisan news and the internet, which we'll get to. Um, but so the cues about who belongs with which party became very, very clear. And, uh, and so it, the, all of these very powerful identities like race and religion became attached to the parties, which means those identities, which were already pretty strong, got stronger because with every election, it's not just your party that loses, but it's also your racial or your religious group that loses or wins. Either way, our, our reactions to those type of competitions become larger and the stakes feel bigger. So it's really this sort of gradual movement of all of these other identities that have been central to American life um, lining up along partisan lines. You know, I, it, it sort of, yeah, uh, one thing I, that what you said raised in my mind was I remember reading a New York Times article when Sherry Bowler, who was a congressman from, from upstate New yeah, York, where Lily's from, <laughs> um, and, uh, and he was sort of a, a fairly liberal Republican, actually, and there were others, at least in, in the, so it's not just a Democratic story. The article said when, when Bowler lost, um, liberal Republicans were an endangered species, now they're extinct, you know. <laughs> Um, and uh, so there's also a story on that side of it yeah. too, right? So it wasn't just Democrats having the issue, it was also the Republicans. David, you were gonna say something. Well, it's sort of related to that, and, and I wanna sort of take a step back and, and talk about a little bit of the, the reason why the Republicans uh, started, um, or why I should, I should say white uh, evangelical Christians in particular started aligning with the Republican Party. And, and so this is a, is a story, and this sounds sort of provocative or even like a paradox, but um, our polarized times are, in, are, a, are a product in part of, um, the steady decline of religious institutions in the United States and sort of like the general trend towards secularization. So and that's, that's true for a few different reasons. I mean, first of all, if you go back to the you know, 50s and 60s and, 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 beyond, and before that, right, there was this sort of common ground kind of vanilla, uh, white mainline Protestant civil religion uh, in the United States that to, to which you know, most Americans generally ad adhered and provided a, a common ground uh, that sort of helped to facilitate um, the bridging of, of differences. As that declined, right, and, and indeed as um, sort of the, the culture became more, more secular, what happened was, uh, was, was, you know, traditional Christians felt threatened. Right, and they felt like that they felt their identities being threatened, and they started to push back. Right, and they because one of the things that went along with secularization was the sexual revolution. Right, and so we had um, the ERA and, and Roe v. Wade and, and um, Griswold versus Connecticut and, and lots of other things that um, were um, disturbing and offensive and threatening to a, a big chunk of society. And and then you had an opportunistic Republican Party that was willing to, to welcome those people into the fold uh, in 1980, and, and hence, ever since then, you've, you've seen this, this uh, trend continue. A couple of other ways that, that, that sort of the, the decline of organized religion has contributed is that um, it also um, contributes to an overall declining sense of social capital that, that we all have, right? Religious institutions used to provide a community for people and, and a place for people to, to come together uh, and know each other and care about each other and know each other's kids and, and they may have political differences, but they, they have these common bonds, right? And so uh, as that source of those bonds has declined along with other things, uh, that's contributed to, to our, our sorting and, and our vitriol uh, toward each other. A, a, a final thing that, that I'll mention on this, and, and if you want to hear more on this, there's a, a lot of good uh, stuff by Emily Ikenata Cato and, and Ross Douthat from the New York Times, uh, who taught, and, and I'm, I haven't personally studied this, but I find this to be a relatively compelling argument um, based on the data that they talk about, uh, is that even the Republican Party now, right, is going through this process of secularization. Right, so there are fewer religiously oriented Republicans now than there were, say, 10 years ago or, or during the, the Bush years. And when, you know, if if a lot of us in this this room, right, uh, who maybe didn't like the religious right, we are are going to really dislike the post-religious right because when when uh, when religion loses its its uh, stronghold over conservative politics, it opens the door for something much much darker, and that's what we're seeing right now. So, so uh, you open the can of worms to about social media, right? <laughs> Do you want to speak to that? I mean, because you know, it's, it's interesting that this conversation about how we got here, neither of you has, has laid the blame at the doorstep of the media, which a lot of people will do. 
Uh, you've said, well, there's actually much more fundamental changes, foundational changes in the nature of American politics and society, which is what you both described. Where does the media fit in? Is it, is it, is it overrated in terms of it, how it should be blamed? Either one of you want to start, start off. Well, I just talked for a long time, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the way that I think about the rise of both social media and um, partisan news um, mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, we, we had these social changes occurring, but those were not necessarily all that visible at any given point in time. And so um, really what Americans need, because we don't, you know, on, on average, Americans don't tend to pay very much attention to politics. We don't, you know, maybe the people sitting in this room do. But, um, but in, on average, right, most Americans don't have the time, and we don't expect them to read every bill and, and figure out what exactly they want their legislator to do. And so we tend to, uh, you know, use, very, use mental shortcuts uh, in order to make our political decisions. And one of those shortcuts is a, you know, which party is people like me and which party is people that are not like me. So having racial and religious sorting into parties was one really easy way for people to figure out which party was like them. Um, but th it doesn't happen in a vacuum. They have to have a place to go to see where the people like them are and to receive a message that says, hey, people like us are on this side and people like that are on that side. And what social media did, at least in my view, is, is to make that message so easy to receive, so much easier to receive than it had been before that. And partisan news did the same thing. It made these cues, these mental shortcuts, very, very easy to find. Whereas er, before, you had to actually pay attention, read a newspaper, you know, watch the news at night. Um, now it's much easier to find out which side is your side and which side is the bad guys. David? Yeah, so, um 20 years ago, I, I wrote a book on partisan media, and, and uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the time, it was just in its infancy, and sort of, I'll go ahead and say, like, predicted that we would, would find ourselves in a, in a, in a, hor a horribly um, polarized time uh, 20 years into the future, so I'll take some credit for that. Um, but, uh, You're to blame you know, I was, very, I was very happy, yeah, yeah. All this has been great for my career. Um, uh, as has Trump, by the way, I'll go ahead and mention, but, um, uh, but so, Partisan media is, is not irrelevant to this story. I, I do want to emphasize that I think that it is a, a, um, a marginal player and, and that the, the blame that gets laid at the feet of partisan media, uh, and especially social media, uh, is a bit overblown. I think that the, the larger culprits are these things that, that both Lily and I have been talking about. But partisan media especially uh, does have a, a role to play. And, and going back to to talk radio in, in the, the 90s and, and then Fox, which was deliberately, you know, Rupert Murdoch went to Roger Ailes and said, yeah, that thing that I'm hearing on AM radio, that Limbaugh thing, we want to, we want to turn that into a TV, right? If you can replicate Limbaugh on TV, we can make a lot of money. Uh, and indeed, they have made a lot of money, right? And so, um, and what happens, right, when people, it's le at least back in the day, right? I mean, everybody knows what Fox News is now. Everybody knows what MSNBC is, and everybody knows what talk radio is, et cetera. But, um, you know, in the early days of, of partisan media, it was possible to um, not necessarily happen upon Sean Hannity by accident, right? But you could sort of like think like, well, you know, I don't like taxes. He doesn't like taxes, right? So I kind of like him. And then over time, you didn't, you didn't know necessarily how you felt about lots of other stuff, right? You didn't necessarily know how you, you felt about Medicare for all or the, or the Green New Deal or the, um, or the immigration, you know, the marauding caravan of, of people or, or, you know, Roe v. Wade or, or what have you. But over time, you came to learn how you were supposed to think about all of those things. And so it provided just another cue, right, uh, to go along with, with what Lily's talking about. And so, um, you know, my evidence, both, both in that book 20 years ago and in the one right now, uh, indicates that partisan media definitely have a role to play. Um, but I will say that, that to our surprise, we actually have not yet been able to find uh, a lot of significant evidence for social media. 
right? There is a logic to it, right? I think we all understand, especially as it relates to, to the algorithms, right? That like it figures out what we like and then it gives us more of that and like, you know, the clickbait and, and all that. But so far, both in, in terms of my own work and in terms of all the other work that I've seen by other people, it actually suggests that, that the so-called echo chambers of social media are, are a bit overblown and that, that we're actually more inclined, believe it or not, to encounter points of view from the other side through social media than we are through other types of media. So switching gears a little bit, we'll get into uh, to, to, uh, a fun topic of uh, who's more to blame, Democrats or Republicans? I mean, there's a, <laughs> a, for, for the polarization, be, and I bring that up not just to be, uh, uh, you know, to be incendiary, but a lot of very important people have said, hey, the Repu it's because of the Republican Party, and yet, um, I, you know, of course, I've read things that these two folks have, have written and, 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 and talked to them both, and it's, it's nowhere near that simple, right, David? Or, or Lily, why don't you start? Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, there's so many ways to think about it, there, right? So there's the elite level where mm. we're looking, you know, you can look at Congress and see polarization of the, our elected officials over time, um, which is extreme. And in fact, it did, you know, pull, the right move further to the right before the left moved further to the left. So that was a leading um, polarizer. But also, uh, if you look on average, so I asked, I've asked a bunch of questions um, of American voters about things like, would you be willing to live next door to an outgroup partisan? Um, would you be willing to be friends with an outgroup partisan? Would you be willing to marry an outgroup partisan? People don't want to marry outgroup partisans in general. But, um, or have their daughter marry one. Or have their child, right, right. Yeah. 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 Or have one marry into the family. Yeah. That's also not right. what they want. Um, but so on that level, actually, Democrats and Republicans are relatively similar in their dislike of the other side. Um, and, and Democrats are actually increasingly slightly more um, desirous of co-partisan neighbors. At the same time, um, you know, the, there is an asymmetry between the parties socially. So Republicans uh, are a very socially homogeneous, compared to Democrats, socially homogeneous party. So the way that I explain it is that if you pick two random Republicans, Republican voters out of the population, the chance that they'll be the same race and religion is quite high. If you pick two Democratic voters out of the population, the chance that they're the same race and religion is actually very low. And so the sort of psychological processes by which we understand who is us and who is them and how we build our boundaries around us and them, um, those, are, those are much more functional in the Republican Party because the boundaries are so visible and easy to understand. Um, so, so yeah, in, in, some, in some cases, Democrats you know, like Democrats best, and in other cases, Republicans are sort of better at policing the boundaries of who belongs and who doesn't. But there would be just to suggest that, that Democrats may be moving in the direction of perhaps being even, even less tolerant yeah, than so, Republicans, which is... So again, yeah, there's a, a few different ways to think about this just to kind of uh, piggyback on what Lily was saying. So to go ahead and plug another book, right? So I, I wrote another book in 2012 that chronicled the difference between uh, the you know, red America and blue America in terms of the degree to which they, the, the public wants their elected officials to sort of make deals and, and go along with the other side versus wants them to, to stand firm. Uh, and Republicans were, were far more likely to sort of demand intransigence, right? And then we saw that all, you know, parlaying up uh, in, to Congress itself, which we also studied that, that showed, as Lily mentioned a second ago, that the right actually was, you know, has polarized much more than the left in Congress in terms of, of the extremity of, of the positions that they take and their unwillingness to, to reach across the aisle. Um, having said that, uh, in, the, in, the, in the recent work, right, on the, the factual stuff, um, we found uh, some really interesting and, and complicated results. And so on some high profile issues that tend to get talked about a lot in, in the media, right, like climate change and sort of like the, the prevalence of racism in society or, or maybe the origins of, of sexuality, um, Republicans seem more misinformed. Right, um, the d Democrats have the quote-unquote science on their side when it comes to, to those those things. However, uh, our evidence indicates that that's just a coincidence. That's a co that's a byproduct of the fact that, that those they just that happens to be true, right? Because when we actually look at um, people's factual perceptions of the truth, 
on a, a host of like a, a dozen different types of issues about which the science is much less clear than the three that I just mentioned, we see that, that liberals are, are just as inclined uh, as conservatives to project their values onto their beliefs. And furthermore, going back to this affective stuff, we randomly, uh, we showed people uh, a fictionalized Twitter accounts of some guy named Bob Stradford, which was like the most white bread name that we could like come up with, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, and so uh, in in Bob David uh, Barker's pretty white bread. Yeah, well, I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I had somebody in one of these audience things where I was showing the, the images. They asked me if the image of Bob Stratford was me, and I was offended. <laughs> but um, but any, anyway, so uh, we we show Bob making these factual claims on on Twitter. Right? And he is sandwiched in between some other stuff like his fandom of the Beatles and the fact that he likes pancakes. And, whatever. and so, uh, so in, in one of the things, he just says something like, hey, you know, like I can't believe that all these, uh, you know, people still uh, don't believe in, in global warming, right? Uh, and then on the other one, he says like, oh, you know, the evidence actually suggests that there hasn't been any significant warming for 15 years and this is all overblown, blah. Relatively innocuous statements, right? We found that, um, that liberals in particular, right, when, when they saw an image of, of Bob basically denying climate science, subsequent to that, they said that they would be unwilling to, to eat a sandwich with him. Uh, they would be unwilling to, to work with him. They would be unwilling to share space with him. And this, and this had been applied to seven, we did this experiment over and over again, with six different issues, and we found the same thing over and over again, which is that liberals hate conservatives more than conservatives hate liberals when it comes to the specific stuff about them supposedly getting the facts wrong. Uh, and we thought that was striking. So one more, more final thing, though, and then I'll stop talking which is that sort of complicates it further. I mentioned before that, that I also study you know, compromise and like the propensity to compromise. When it comes to that though, there is still um, uh, a tendency for the right to be more intransigent. So. I would also just add that the, yeah. I mean, in addition to all of this, uh, the uh, sort of on a basic human level, yeah. um, the, the inclination to want our side to be the best and to yeah. win is yeah. universal. Right. And, um, distributed, you know, completely equally across the entire population, whether um, you're Republican or Democrat, and and similarly, um, our ability to uh, to engage in you know motivated reasoning and see what we want to see in the world, um, that type of biased perception of the world is also just a universal human thing, and it, you know, there's no there's no partisanship behind right. who is biased about the way they see the world. It's just it's central to who we are as people. Right. And if yeah. I could say one, uh, we're sort of getting you off. Yeah, your, your thing. No, no, that's no, good. but I have one more thing to say on that, that too, which is another provocative statement. Uh, this motivated reasoning, this, this natural human tendency toward it that Lily describes actually worsens with greater, with higher levels of education, right? And so back to the, to the first question that started all this off, which is how we got here. One of the reasons we are more polarized now than we used to be is because we're more educated now than we used to be. Right? And that as we become a more educated society, what happens is, that, again, this is a paradox, right? is that we actually become better counter-arguers. Right? We become, become better able to filter through all the noise and find the thing that, that seems to comport with what we believe and like filter out the stuff that doesn't and just sort of like reaffirm, reaffirm, reaffirm. Uh, and that is another thing that, that we observe in our book. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think uh, we accept in a courtroom the adversarial process, I think, generally speaking, that, that, the, that the defense attorney is stretching the facts as far as she can go to try to, you know, get, get her person off. Meanwhile, the prosecutor, uh, you know, he can't, he, he can't lie, but he can stretch the facts. And so you're building a case. And at some level, politics is supposed to be like that too, right? Because we have conflicts inevitable in a country where, you know, the, is there any expectation that the person who represents Western Nebraska would have anything in common with, with the person who represents East LA or, or somewhere in Brooklyn? No, there's, and so you're going to have conflict. <coughs> so what I'm getting to in a very roundabout way is what does polarization then matter? It's almost like an expectation that people would come on different sides. Why, why should we worry about this? So the, I, I mean, I guess I would think about this question as, the other qu way you could ask it is, what does someone in rural Nebraska have in common or not have in common yeah. with someone in rural Vermont, 
right? Because they are very different voters, um, even though they probably have relatively similar interests. And so um, I think what we're seeing is that the, and this is um, you know, something that other uh, political scientists have found, is that one thing that polarization does is it sort of, it nationalizes our politics. Right. So that when we have localized politics, we can make choices that are in the interest of our local areas. And we expect our, rep our representatives to do that. Uh, once our politics are, are extremely polarized and these Democratic and Republican identities become really powerful, um, we start expecting our elected officials not to worry about our own little district in, South, you know, in rural Nebraska, but instead to think about you know, what's in the interest of the National Republican Party or what's in the interest of the National Democratic Party. And once we, once we begin to do that, individual interests go by the wayside in lieu of this really sort of just brutal fight over who gets to win. And the way that I explain it in, in my book is to say, you know, when we talk about, you know, when we think about social identity being central to all of this, what we're really saying is who is winning. And, um, and, we, and we think about who gets to win, Democrats or Republicans, who gets to win even legislation. And so when we, when we say who wins legislation, right, who wins government, the answer should not be one political party or the other. The answer should be as many people as possible, right? Like as many Americans as possible, the greater good comes out of everything that we do. And instead, we focus a lot more, and as citizens, we're willing to sacrifice a lot of our own good in order to feel that sense of victory, almost like we're watching a sports game. Yep. And then, you know, when you watch the Super Bowl, you just go home afterwards, and you don't call up your, your favorite player and ask him to please do the thing that you wanted him to do, right? You just let him go, because he gave you the win, and you feel great. So it's, you know, the more that we sort of nationalize and sportify politics, yeah. it's, it becomes uh, easier for, for elected officials to be less accountable and to be less yeah. representative of their, of their constituents. Mm -hmm. So it's UNC against Duke is what we're Something like that, <laughs> yeah. which is what I think we'll see in a couple weeks. So, um, uh, so to back up for a second and just to, to go back to your, your initial point about like, you know, you know, maybe in some respects polarization isn't so bad. Um, Lily knows and some of the other folks in this room may even remember, um, you know, a, a while back the, the, political, the American Political Science Association actually bemoaned the fact, right, that there was not enough partisan polarization in politics and it was a, a big thing, right? Back in the, in the 50s and, and, and 60s, uh, people were worried about the fact that there, you know, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Democrats and the Republicans and, and again, like the idea is that this was bad for democracy because as Lily pointed out, we can't expect most voters to really pay that close of attention to everything and so partisan provides a really useful cue, right? And so if the parties can provide coherent policy platforms that are distinct from each other, then that simplifies the process for voters and makes it easier for voters to, to figure out which one of them matches up their interests and their values and like, you know, democracy can function effectively. Um, and that's true, right? And, and so we would, would, would expect, you know, some degree of, of partisan polarization, which has obviously happened, the sorting, right? is a, a dem democratically useful thing. Another thing I'll say is that, I don't think that Lily has come right out and, and said this so far, but sort of in between the, the lines of what she's been, been talking about, is that part of the reason that we have polarized is a natural byproduct of increasing diversity, right, in our, in our country, right? And a lot of the people in this room, I would imagine, probably agree that, that that's something to be celebrated and something that is, is good. And, and so as we have seen more diversity, we have seen more polarization because we're in a transition period, right? And that maybe we're gonna come out of it on, on the other side, right? But it's, it's na a natural byproduct of, of that. And that's something that, again, most of us think is a good thing. Um, as to, to why we should care about the, the downside right now, uh, again, in the same way that, that, well, I'm not sure anymore, right? We, we, we used to all believe in markets. Uh, we don't all believe in markets anymore. But uh, uh, in, the, in the same way that, that we like the idea of a, uh, a well-functioning marketplace where, where competition can happen, right? And, and, and because of that competition, right, sort of like the, the best, you know, prices lower and, and products improve and everything's better off, right? Um, but that marketplace can get perverted right, by uh, monopolies and, and stuff like that. Well, it's the same way in, in democracy, right, which people sometimes describe as a marketplace of ideas, right, where everybody's supposed to be able to come in and, and the different points of view compete and then, and then through that competitive process, the, the best ideas rise to the top. But if, 
people are unwilling to sort of like think of that common good. If they just think of it in terms of a team sport, then that marketplace of ideas turns into a flea market of ideas, right? And that's basically where we are right now. If I could just underscore what yeah. David was saying about sort of the, you know, maybe this is a, a good process, a healthy process. Um, in fact, the fact that we have so much, you know, so much of this sorting is really racial yeah. um, and based, you know, based in this increasing diversity um, and in, you know, the fact that we're addressing uh, a legacy of, of, you know, white supremacy and, and um, institutionalized racism that we really haven't as a nation really dealt with completely ever. Um, and so if it, if you imagine the, the reckoning in American politics with a legacy of institutionalized racism for hundreds of years, uh, I would imagine that that reckoning would feel very chaotic and difficult and there would be conflict and there would be backlash and we would be disagreeing and yelling a lot. And so it would probably feel like this, right? If, if we were to have a, rec a you know, reckoning with the racial history of American politics, uh, it, it's possible that that's just what this is, that it feels bad because it's going to be hard to do that. And we don't know yet whether we get to come out on the other side of it or whether we let the backlash, you know, lash back. But, but it is possible that that's, that's what we're sitting in right now. Yeah, and you know, the racial reckoning in the, in the mid-1960s involved riots at levels that, that you know, for, for many of the younger people here, they wouldn't have, you know, unless they go back and look at newsreels, you wouldn't even conceive of. Uh, but the and, really and important thing about that is that part of the reason there were riots is that there wasn't a party that right. was standing on the That's side. Right. There was no institutionalized right. way for people to ask the government to do this for them. Right, and people weren't allowed to vote right. in large numbers. So um, what you raise, uh, Lily, and, and David as well, uh, a lot of the, the I mean, truly great thought leaders and intellectuals in the United States do raise in the major media you know, the specter of, of civil war. They use that language. Is that overblown? Probably. Uh, I mean, uh, for some of the reasons that we just uh, alluded to, right? I mean, you just mentioned the fact that, that the, the strife in, in American politics is more partisan now, right? So that's what we've been talking about here today is that we've got more partisan polarization since in, in, any time since you know, around the Civil War. But in terms of like general political strife, it's actually somewhat more subdued than it was in the 60s and the 70s where people were, you know, bombing uh, places and there was, again, like major violence on a, on a fairly regular basis. And so the, and, and it's what Lily said, right? We've, we now have more political channels uh, through which to um, express uh, those forms of, of protest. And so for that reason, right, the, the partisan polarization actually might be the thing that, that keeps us from shooting at each other. You know, and, and uh, I was, I'm glad you said that because I came prepared with a, with a quote from Time Magazine. <laughs> you know, and you know, the stuff that gets all the attention are, are, are things like the, 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 the crack-ups at the 68 Democratic Convention in Chicago. Yeah. And, and there, were, there were hijackings by radical groups back in those days. But uh, this, again, is from a recent article in Time Magazine. In the 1970s, bombing attacks were growing by the day. They had begun as crude, simple things, mostly Molotov cocktails, college radicals hurled through ROTC buildings. The first actual bombing campaign, the work of a group of New York radicals led by a militant named Sam Melville, featured attacks on a dozen buildings around Manhattan between August and November of 69, uh, when Melville and most of his friends were arrested. The Weather Underground's attack, attacks began three months later, and by 1971, protest bombings had spread across the country. In a single 18-month period during 71 and 72, the FBI counted 2,500 bombings on American soil, almost five a day. So that's that's different than what we're seeing now. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, so I think, and this is directly related to David's, to David's uh, book, um, you know, the only, t the only place that gives me mm -hmm. pause or concern is that part of the reason we're not in a, a situation like the 60s is that we have this, this, you know, political, electoral, legitimate place to have these conversations and to have these arguments. We can vote for what we want the government to do about these social divides, um, and the party that we vote for, can, you know, is 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 effectively taking sides at this point. Yeah. So, um, so that that funnels or channels all of this energy into a place that is democratic. The the times when I get worried about it, and I've started measuring attitudes towards political violence in the yeah. in, among yeah. the American electorate. Um, I, we've just, you know, we've just started collecting data, so there's some slightly disturbing levels of people who are willing to 
accept violence, um, but not very high. And we haven't looked at it over time, so it might not be any different. Um, but the thing that concerns me is that when, when that channel, that legitimate channel, through, elect through elections um, becomes questioned, right? So when the legitimacy of an election um, is, is challenged, that's the type of situation in which um, we lose that, that sort of you know, release valve. And in fact, people who study um, uh, civil war in other countries um, you know, talk about multiple ways that you can sort of predict a civil war might happen. And um, one of them is racial and ethnic polarization along political lines. Uh, so we have that. Um, but the other two are uh, economic catastrophe and, and adverse regime change. And so, as our if our elections begin to be seen as illegitimate based on factual, you know, disagreements, um, that reduces the legitimacy of the election. It possibly makes re regime change seem adverse to more people. Um, and also, you know, it's important to remember that we're in a very healthy economy right yep. now. And if that were to change, we're, yep. there's no guarantee that we would still see, you know, people are comfortable generally, not everyone, but um, in comparison to, you know, prior times, people, a lot of people are pretty comfortable. So if that changes on a, on a broad level, um, and people are no longer ready to just sit in their chair and enjoy their things that they got for very cheap, um, they may not feel quite so peaceful. David. Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. Again, in 1971-72, we were in the, the throes of, of the most unpopular war in American history, and we were also in, uh, you know, pretty horrific recessionary period. Right now, right, we're in, and you know, these are the salad days, right? I mean, that seemed like it, right? But this is, you know, relative peace and prosperity, uh, and we still hate each other this much. So, like, imagine if we were in the midst of the Vietnam War and, you know, uh, you know, uh, stagflation uh, right now. We might, we might actually see more and more violence, and that might especially be true if we have one more electoral cycle in which the popular vote does not match the electoral college. Right, that, that could be the, the channel through which at least one side of the spectrum decides, okay, I'm done. It's time to take to the streets. So, so in terms of, um, you know, you, you started a conversation, like, where is it going forward in terms of, uh, generally speaking, people recognize, certainly as represented in the, in the presidential nomination process, Republicans move to the right, and, and that's, that's happened in Congress, and there's been sort of a capture uh, by maybe even now a more nationalist uh, right wing of the party. Um, are the Democrats headed in that direction? I'm, it's probably too early to tell, but you're political scientists and science is about, you know, prediction in part. Um, uh, you know, are they headed in the in same direction? Doing that in 2016. <laughs> right. You said you were right 20 years ago, though, you know, about yeah. Fox News. But um, yeah. the, uh, you know, is, is, is that where it's headed? And, and what's the impact of that if it were to be that? So my sense of it is, uh, I'm much less, I'm much less worried, perhaps, than maybe David will be about um, the sort of you know leftist revolution, um, largely because you know the nationalist uh, sort of edge to what's happening on the right um, is something that we've actually had before in this country and has mm -hmm. has blossomed before. So it's something realistic, um, and there are people who are you know ready to ready and willing to bring it back. Um, whereas the sort of socialist edge of the Democratic Party has never really taken hold here, and it's unclear whether anyone is even advocating for you know, the government to take over everything. It seems like no one is actually really advocating for socialism. Um, so in, in my view of it, I'm much, more, I'm much more concerned about the sort of you know, white supremacist nationalist backlash that we're also seeing in Europe and we're seeing in other in other Western democracies, um, that seems to be the more ascendant movement um, across the globe um, than a left than a leftward sort of movement. We're not really seeing that anywhere else, and we're not seeing it very strongly here yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I wouldn't say that I'm concerned uh, normatively, right, about the uh, the move to the left um, within the Democratic Party. Uh, I, th I think that it's really interesting. Right? It, it's something that, that, as Lily mentioned, we've never really seen before in American politics and the rapidity with which um, the mainstream of the Democratic Party has come to resemble Bernie Sanders is striking, right? Uh, for, for anybody, you know, over 40 years old, like the idea that we could beat 
talking like and not laughing, right, about some of the stuff that, that is, is, is main, you know, part of the, the mainstream Democratic Party platform now is, is really, really striking. And again, maybe it's exciting, right? Maybe it's, it's, it's you know, uh, the, the next step and, and something that we should all be um, championing. I don't know. But it is really, really interesting. Um, I will say that I think that that, that is ultimately where we're going. Right, but I think that it's going to sort of dip. Right, but I think that in terms of this particular cycle, the the, the media fascination with AOC uh, and you know and the, the Bernie Bros and and sort of like the the general uh, march left within the Democratic Party doesn't quite match the data. When you actually look at most Democratic Party voters, most of them are still pretty moderate, right? Socialism is still unpopular. Most of them still say that they, you know, want somebody, you know, who looks more like Joe Biden, right, than, uh, uh, than, than maybe uh, AOC. And so, particularly given the fact that we are in times of economic prosperity, Right? The, the need for a complete structural overhaul of, of our eco economy is going to be less uh, appealing. And B, particularly in this era of Trump, uh, an, an era in which, again, on surveys, voters say over and over and over and over again, the thing that they want out of their nominee more than anything else is somebody who can beat Trump. I think that that disinclines the party from ultimately nominating one of the leftists in 2016. Elizabeth Warren herself called herself a capitalist. You're right. Right. So even right. exactly. It's her self-definition. Right. Well, let's take some, a few questions from the audience before we move to the, res, uh, uh, the reception. This gentleman right here is first. Well, thank you for very, thank you for the very thoughtful conversation. Uh, recently, you've you've heard Robert Kagan talk about authoritarianism and liberalism. Seems very similar to the arguments I'm I'm hearing today, without tossing the labels aside. Um, and all three of you are academics. Um, I'd be interested in your point of view on that article and the, the thesis. And, and uh, just so I can, uh, and, and that's, that's one of the most interesting things I've read in a long time. The article is, I think the title is Strong Men is in the title. Robert Kagan is spelled K-A-G-A-N. It's in the Washington Post. I encourage you all to read it, um, and I'll let you guys comment. I haven't seen the actual article, but I mean, I can I can comment on on the role of authoritarianism in American politics if if you'd like. Like, what what is the actual the specific article? What is the the point or the argument? Uh, that, uh, liberalism is is declining. And uh. Authoritarianism oh. is rising. So so, so what yeah. it is is a, it's a transnational. Right. Yeah 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 yeah. It's a transnational. Uh, uh, Transnational strongman yeah. authoritarian yeah. thing that's happening. I mean, I think that's undeniable, right? I mean, you see that um, uh, across the globe, from from Latin America to Turkey to to, to Europe, right? Um, you know, to to Brexit, right? To to here, um, fueled in many places by a few different things, but but Im, you know, immigration, right? And and uh, refugees and, and migration. So uh, traditional populations and and countries. Uh, are are sensing this this upheaval? They're they're feeling their their cultures being threatened, as I as I said before, right? That can that sort of threat, that perceived threat, can be racial, it can be religious, it can be uh, a number of different things. But when when people do feel that that threat, uh, they push back, and 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 a lot of it turns out that. May, a lot, maybe most humans have an authoritarian streak in their heads uh, that gets triggered when they perceive themselves to be under threat, right? And so we're talking about all these populations that are, are perceiving their cultures to be under threat and they're, and they're, and they're pushing back, right? And they're, and they're looking for somebody to be the savior, right? And, and again, we've seen that in a variety of different places across the globe. Yeah, the way that I'm, I think, I think about it from a more psychological perspective on sort of the individual level, um, you know, if one thing that we that we know about the way the ways that people react to threat um, is I, I like to call it like uh, imagine that you're you know all alone on a savanna and you hear a lion roar right <laughs> and you don't know where the lion roar is coming from uh, but you're alone so you're probably going to hide you're going to feel anxious and afraid and you're going to hide uh, but if you've got a huge band of people all around you and you've got a leader who's pointing to the lion then you're going to go attack right you're going to defend yourself and attack and it's it's almost like by, by pointing fingers, correctly or not, you know, at a, at a scapegoat group, which of, often is refugees or immigrants, um, these right-wing leaders can actually take a population of people who's feeling very anxious and afraid and uh, uncertain as to why they're feeling, why things are, are feeling wrong, 
and turn that anxiety into anger and get them to move. And, and that ability is really only available to people who are willing to point to, even if they're pointing to a tree trunk and saying, that's the lion, right? Everyone's gonna go attack the tree trunk, but at least they're gonna feel good about it, right? And so, so it, you know, it's a really great, to, easy, great. It's a really, really easy tool for right-wing yeah. um, leaders to actually use to get people on their side and, and moving. Just like the Jews. Do we have any questions on right. right. Anybody else? There's one right over there in the center. Um, an American University PhD student. Yes, yeah, so I'm one of Professor Baca's students. Hello. Yeah. Um, so I Don't ask to... too hard of a question. Now. Yeah. <laughs> this will be the lily. Yeah. So I wanted to get back to this in terms of kind of framing it as winning and losing. I keep thinking about this quote that I think I read in the New York Times in response to some of Trump's policies, like he's not hurting the people he's supposed to be hurting. And one of the things I really appreciated in your book, Professor Mason, was this idea that even when we agree and we can all win on something, the idea that the other side would win is unthinkable. So we'd rather all lose as long as the other side loses more than us. Yeah. So I guess I just wanted to ask, like, how, how have we got to this point? Is it that we're kind of more aware of the stakes of winning and losing? Are the stakes higher? Or is there, I don't know, is there some other dynamic that's making really? us see yeah. in terms of this? Other than that you're going to serve on his dissertation committee. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Outside reader. <laughs> uh, so what, what, uh, what you're referring to is the, these, these old psychological experiments from the 70s where yeah. uh, people were just told that they had an identity um, yeah. and then they were asked uh, basically, you know, you can allocate money, either everybody in the experiment gets $5 or your group gets four but the other group gets three. And which, which condition would you prefer? It's a group you've never heard of, you're never gonna meet any of the other members of it, um, and over and over again, people, cho people chose this win condition over this greater good condition. So even with a meaningless group that has almost no effect on anyone's life, um, the human condition is to say, I want those guys to be worse off than I am, and I'm willing to sacrifice my own good for that. So that's our baseline, that's like the lowest level of group identification. Um, and, and then once, so that, this is why social sorting I think is so dangerous, is because what we do is we start piling extremely meaningful identities on top of that, that base instinct. And as those identities are, you know, as more and more identities become piled on top of our partisanship, that need for victory becomes deeper and deeper. And, and the sense of loss that we feel every single election, if we lose, is devastating. It's even more devastating. And so we end up with this, you know, we have this very basic sort of primal human need to, win, to sacrifice even, you know, in order to win. Um, and then apply that to an increasingly large portion of our sort of self-esteem and who we think we are in the world. Um, that is a sort of a very, very dangerous combination of, of human instincts, I think. Yeah, and a couple other things to, to go along with that uh, that have contributed to, to making it worse, right? And so. One is just the level of competitiveness between the parties, right? So again, if you use the, the sports team metaphor, the team that you root for, right? If you, let's, let's say that you're, um, I don't know, a Browns fan, right? The Cleveland Browns have not been competitive for 20 years, right? And so uh, in, in many cases, they might be next year, um, but, but uh, they haven't been, right? And so if you are a fan of a team who like, really doesn't have that much chance of, of winning, you don't care that much, right? You know, you're, frankly, right? You're sort of like, eh, like maybe I'll watch the game, maybe I won't, but like it doesn't matter that much because I don't expect that much. But when, but when both sides, right, are, are, are within a couple of percentage points of each other, right, when they're, when they're balanced and with, with each electoral cycle, both at the congressional level and the presidential level, you know that, that you know, victory hangs in the balance, right, then that makes you much more emotionally engaged, right, and so that's where we are right now. The other thing that contributes to this, and so this goes back to the media, but this one isn't about partisan media, this is just about the, the general media frame that is applied to politics where everything is about winning and losing, right? And this is, you know, again, this is not a Fox News story. This is a New York Times, Washington Post, NBC, CNN, you, you name it story where, where, where we read about and hear about and watch politics in this country as a spectator sport and not just during elections, right? The whole shutdown and all that, that was com framed completely in terms of like Trump losing, Pelosi winning or whatever. And so when everything is framed like that, surprise, surprise, right, we buy into it. Yeah, and, and uh, one of Lily's colleagues at the University of Maryland, Francis yeah. Lee, 
uh, develops that point really well about how the, the uh, in the, beginning a little bit in the 80s, but especially in the 90s uh, with the Gingrich Republican Revolution, the the outcome of who would have power in Congress has much been much more up for grabs, and that changes right. that changes a lot in terms of the incentive structure. Do we have a question on this side? There's a lady back in the back, Mike. Good question. Yeah, so um, the, there is an increasing body of work that finds that you can predict people's partisanship with almost anything, um, including the type of car they drive, the grocery store they shop at, the TV that they watch, um, the type of soda that they drink, the type of beer that they drink. Uh, there is a, a computer scientist out of Stanford um, can predict within 95% uh, correctness uh, which party a, an individual neighborhood will vote for by counting the number of Priuses versus pickup trucks parked on the street using Google Earth. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. it's amazing. Uh, so, yes, this, the, the, there is, abs and I think this is really important actually, is that this is a cultural, this is an increasingly cultural yep. difference. Yeah, I, I don't think, let me just add to that. I, I don't think sort of along with the Prius versus pickups, um, I could I could have the details wrong on this, so you know don't hold me to it. But I think this is right. So, I don't, so which is the Democrat and which is the Republican? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think that a single um, uh, electoral d congressional district in the country went red in 2018 if it had a Whole Foods. Right. Whole Foods versus Kroger. Whole Foods, is for, yeah. Another one. You can predict yeah. a neighborhood. And and uh, what's that cracker like? Um, cracker what's that barrel. Cracker Barrel, right? Yep. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. Yeah, Carrie, go ahead. Hi, yeah, this is such a great conversation. Thank you both for being here. Um, so I just wanted to maybe push a little more on the question from a couple cycles back um, about, and getting back to what you both had to say about issue-based partisanship and affective-based partisanship. So, and the relative ratio with which we're motivated by one or the other. Um, so I think one of the things that constantly puzzles me is why the affective-based partisanship isn't more eclipsed at this moment in time by the issue-based side of it. The fact that the majority of Americans are operational liberals, I think, speaks to this. Now, if the stakes were low on these issues, I could understand more why the affective side would trump, so to speak, huh. the issue-based side. But when you're talking about things like health care, preserving protections for pre-existing conditions, ensuring that social, the social safety net survives, including social security, and the asymmetry between the two sides is so yeah. extraordinary on those issues, yeah. why that doesn't elevate the yeah. relevance the great and importance that's a great question, of Carrie. the issue-based side more. You, that's a great you question. Want me to start? You, you could start. Okay. Yeah. So, Part Thanks, of this, Gary. I mean, first of all, I agree that it's a, a great question and I won't pretend to like completely be able to answer it, but uh, I think that part of the story uh, does have to do with the degree of sophistication within the electorate, right? And so um, if you, again, if you look at surveys or, or, or whatever, uh, if, you, if you narrow your sample just to Americans who pay a reasonable amount of attention to politics and sort of like know something about it, you actually do see quite a bit more issue polarization along the lines of what you would expect based on, on what you're saying. But the thing is, um, for very good reasons, again, this is no sort of like knock on, on the American people, but you know, people are busy, right? They gotta get the kid to Taekwondo and like freaking f go through McDonald's. and like, You gotta watch you know, Seinfeld reruns. Like, like there's, there's, there's a lot to do in our lives, right? And, uh, and so like, and most people just aren't paying that close of attention to politics and so they don't necessarily even know a lot of this stuff that you're saying, right? And so, but what they do know, right, is that I'm white, and a male and a Christian from the South, and so is that guy, and she's not, right? And like, I'm with that guy, right? So. I would also, yeah, I mean, so this I think goes back to the, like the what's, what's the matter with Kansas question, yeah. right? Like why are people voting yeah. against their best interests? Um, and the answer to that question I think it has, has always been define their interests, right. right? We assume that people's most important interests yeah. are their health and their financial security. 
Um, but in fact, if you take someone who is feeling like a loser, um, and the only way for that person to feel individually good about themselves is to hold on to a group identity that is ascendant and winning and superior to other groups. Um, that pulls them out of this place that feels terrible. And so when you're in a place that psychologically makes you feel bad about yourself, maybe your, your interest is to just get out as fast as you possibly can and not to think about these very practical policy things. Um, instead to, to say, my status is not okay right now. I want my status to be better. Either it has been, my status has been reduced in society and I don't feel comfortable with that, or other people are coming and taking over what I think should be mine. And so, you know, psychologically, logically, yes, those, those things really do matter, but psychologically, I think, uh, there are really very serious status threats that people feel and they, they respond to them in, almost implicitly, right? That response comes first, psychologically. So we're going to have, uh, we're gonna have one more question and then we're going to uh, uh, go to a reception to which you're all invited. Sir, you've been very patient. Thank you. Right. Oh, sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you, ha you have a representative from East L.A. and you just can't expect that person, that representative from East L.A. to have the same kind of interest as somebody from, I think you said Nebraska, right? Western was, Nebraska. Western was, Nebraska, was, right? I know the guy who's the congressman out there. Okay. He's a very honorable right. man, Adrian so, Smith. So that raises a question is, what if the federal government as a whole, and including the judiciary uh, were less intrusive into what people were doing in the states. In other words, let California be California, let Nebraska be Nebraska, and then that might reduce uh, some of the threat that people are feeling from the other side. Because if you want to be San Francisco, you can go there and you can live like San Francisco or New Jersey or New York. But if you want to live like Texas or yeah. Nebraska or Utah, right. you can yeah. go there. And that so, might lower the temperature. That's interesting. So, do you think that would work? I mean, pe you, people, the, well, pe the, the two parties' views about federalism, which is what you're talking right. about, have sometimes shifted a little bit right. in an so, interesting yeah. way. So, I mean, this is speaking a, a bit to what uh, Lily was talking about before. It is definitely the case that the more politic, and I don't, I don't want to speak to sort of like, you know, whether or not the government should is intrusive or not or whatever, but it, but it is definitely the case that as politics is more nationalized, right, it is also more polarized. And so um, to the degree that, that politics is more local, that people can sort of like get involved with their neighbors around some, you know, uh, issue relating to, to their uh, community and try to work on that together. They get to know each other again. It's hard to hate people that you sort of like see and, and talk to and work with on, on some issue. And that and that does lower the temperature, right? But but when everything is about the, the big major culture wars between the you know, red America and, and blue America, uh, that's when things really in, intensify. And so, you know, as to how this necessarily speaks to the, um, advisability of, of federalism, uh, I'll leave that alone because, you know, federalism has such a, a, a controversial history uh, as it relates to some of the things that we've been talking about today. Lily, yeah. Yeah. last word. Uh, <laughs> I, I would just, in terms of this particular question, you know, it, there's also an assumption that mobility is possible for most people, and that's generally not yeah. the case. It costs a lot of money to move. And so if, if you're living in a place that, you know, whose politics you don't like yeah. um, and you can't leave, then your incentive is to go get involved in politics and try to change the way the state is. And if, yeah. and if the majority of the state doesn't, you know, re reflect your your priorities or even your rights, yeah. um, then then you know it's that ends up saying, you know, well, if you live in Mississippi, then you disagree that everything in Mississippi is perfectly fine, um, and that sort of doesn't necessarily reflect the way that we expect our citizens to engage in politics. Thank you both very much for coming Thank to you. the library to engage in this conversation. Thank you. Yeah.